All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Just to make sure that we have time to go over everything. So welcome everyone to this month's Open Door Workshop. Today we're going to be talking about ways to pay for assistive technology. Um, first, I'm going to go over some upcoming events and exciting news and a little overview of No Wrong Door um, and um, our integrated support star, and then David is going to go ahead and take over and tell us about ways to pay for assistive technology. All right. So some upcoming events. Um, the 2022 MACDDS Fall Conference is October 5th through 7th, um, and the Show Me Summit um, on aging and health is September 12th through 14th. Um, there are also some new DMH events. Um, these will all be in our um, August No Wrong Door newsletter, so you can get more information about them there. We also have our Good Life groups. These are held monthly for families by families. Um, we have ones for um, different age groups. Um, so I'm gonna go through those quickly. We have the blast off, which is for 13 and under. Um, that's Wednesdays from one to two. Launch, which is for ages 14 to 26. Um, and that is Fridays from 10 to 11. Then we have our planning forward, which is 27 and up. And this is Monday mornings from 1030 to 1130. And our sibling centered, which is um, for siblings with people um, of people with de developmental disabilities. And this is the third Tuesdays at 12. Um, I will send a link at some point in the chat so that you can go ahead and register for any of these. Um, all right, so a little overview on No Wrong Door. Um, the goal is to transform the way that people access services in the community. Um, we want to support individuals and caregivers to make sure that their decisions are on complete and accurate information um, about their options. Um, so the No Wrong Door is a national framework and it is not designed to build a new state infrastructure. Um, so the um, project team works to build a statewide network of front door entities um, that work together to support access to long-term services and supports in the community. Um, and we look to enhance the skills and knowledge of information and referral options counseling and or case management positions. Um, so some of our partners, so um, UMKC IHD, um, Missouri Assistive Tech. Um, we also work closely with um, DMH, DHSS, um, and Missouri Health Net. Um, a brief overview of what um, Charting the Life course is, if you are not familiar with it. Um, Charting the Life course is a problem solving and planning um, framework and principles um, that was created to help all individuals and families um, to explore their life possibilities, share ideas, hopes, and fears, set higher expectations, navigate their future, advocate for their vision, and problem solve and plan. So one of the tools that we're going to be talking about today um, is the integrated support star. Um, so um, the integrated support star is a tool that helps you identify, identify supports that you are already using now um, and helps you think about other services and supports that may be helpful. Um, the right supports can help ensure quality of life. Um, and using various supports in combination can help you achieve your vision for a good life. So as you can see on the screen, um, there are five different categories um, in the integrated support star. So your personal strengths and assets are any skills or personal abilities 
um, strengths that you have and or assets that you may have that could help you um, find services or supports. Um, your relationships are any family members or friends or acquaintances that may be able to help you find supports or may be able to help give you support. Um, eligibility specific supports um, are ones that are um, government paid services that are based on um, eligibility, whether it's um, your age, your income, things like that. Um, Community-based supports are places or groups within your community um, that are local um, that could help provide services. Um, and then technology would be any personal technology that you use, your phone, simple things like that, or assistive or adaptive or environmental technology um, that can help you within your community. So I am going to go ahead and pass it over to David and he is going to tell us about some different funding sources. All right, thank you very much, Angelina and good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to our latest installment in the mod series. I think maybe we're at 15 or 16 of these that we've, we've uh, had. So it's always a pleasure to see uh, a number of you return and to add new folks to this as we all try to continue to learn and figure out how to uh, provide the best services we can to the individuals we work with. So we're gonna talk about finding funds or ways to pay for assistive technology today. And I will confess up front that this is going to be fairly high level. We're not going to have an opportunity to kind of really go in depth, but I wanted to just kind of throw a whole bunch of options up against the wall and hopefully uh, everybody will learn something here or find another um, uh, maybe another way to look at funding uh, because this is always an issue that we're dealing with when it comes to uh, seeking out assistive technology. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, we're going to start with a little bit of good news and bad news on this subject. The good news is, and those of you who have seen me speak before, I almost always go down this route of the good news is we have so many exciting forms of assistive technology or technology that can be used in uh, ways that benefit people with disabilities. And there are so many more things that we can do now that we uh, only dreamed of five or 10 years ago. So, you know, that is always good news. But unfortunately, on the flip side of the coin, there are so many responsibilities that we have and staying up on all the forms of assistive technology can be a struggle. And then also the struggle of finding ways to be able to fund the assistive technology that we know is gonna benefit somebody, either ourselves or somebody that we work with. So one of the other pieces of bad news, and if we move on to the next slide, is that in, I've been working in the field of assistive technology for quite a few years now. And one of the things that I've noticed here recently is that kind of how we talk about funding hasn't really changed. So if you go out and you Google funding assistive technology, it will almost inevitably lead you to websites that just provide a list and everything that they can think of uh, that they can fit in the kitchen sink is going to be on this list. So this is just kind of a sort of a representative sample here that we're looking at. So if I go out and Google assistive technology and I just randomly pick a site, it's probably going to have a list that says, well, Medicaid or Medicare, private insurance, employer, there are national organizations, or there are local organizations like the ABC Foundation or the 123 Council that fund assistive technology. And there's nothing wrong with these lists. Um, they are very helpful and they're a starting point. But unfortunately, if we move to the next slide, what I think kind of happens sometimes is we, when people look at those lists, they kind of find themselves in this maze of kind of working their way through all these options that are thrown up there on the screen. And some of them are gonna pan out, some of them aren't. And they're still trying to work their way through the maze to get to that 
prize at the end, which is finding the source that'll fund the assistive technology that they're looking for. And so that just also sometimes leads to people just getting frustrated and essentially kind of banging their head on the desk uh, because they have spent a lot of time and effort and kind of made some wrong turns here and there. And they just have run out of steam and wonder if there's any source out there that can fund the assistive technology that they're looking at. And I will confess that I am the little girl at times where I have tried to help people um, uncover funding sources, gone down this road, gone down that road, and I end up kind of like her where I'm just like, man, this shouldn't be this, this difficult. So um, we're going to kind of talk about funding and uh, we've sort of worked it into the, to the star that the Charting the Life Force um, plan utilizes. And But before we do that, I want to do a quick little review of some concepts that we've sort of introduced to folks as time has gone on, because I think they also come into play when we talk about funding. So the first one over there on the left is that we always need to remember that assistive technology is really an umbrella term. And so not only are we talking about the devices, but we're talking about the related services. So when we think about funding assistive technology, we also need to, to think about those services that are gonna go along with that device that we're seeking funding for. And if at all possible, work those services into our funding um, thinking, our funding ask, all those types of things. So services could in involve things like um, you know, replacement parts for a piece of assistive technology or training or maybe even evaluation. So we need to make sure that when we're examining the idea of funding that we're talking about the devices and the related services as sort of our whole funding package. In the middle there, and I'm not sure how, how well that text is showing up on your screens, but we've, we've introduced a couple of times the concept of um, sort of the uh, spectrum of assistive technology. And by that, I mean that we divide assistive technology into low tech, mid tech, and high tech. And sometimes it seems to me that we sort of drive our funding um, by what devices are going to be funded. And sometimes those may not be the most appropriate device. So we might be seeking an augmentative communication device, um, but we realize that the funding source is more geared towards high tech devices. Well, that may not be the appropriate device for the individual you're working with, because as we've covered in past episodes of this webinar series, we want to uh, work our way up the technology scale, low, mid and high, because if we can find a low tech, less expensive, less technical device that helps somebody overcome a barrier, then it's more likely that they're gonna continue to use that. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're thinking through funding or identifying devices that you wanna get funding. Don't let the funding source drive you uh, as to the device. You need to make sure that the device that you are seeking funding for is going to be the appropriate one for the individual that you are working with. The, the other concept that we've talked about a couple of times is the fact that not all technology is labeled assistive technology. And this is one of the evolutions we've seen over the last decade or, or so. We still have lots of devices that we sort of refer to as traditional assistive technology. And there are devices that are designed uh, for people with disabilities to help them overcome a situation. And you know, there are you know, any number of computer adaptations or low tech aids or um, hearing related or speech related types of assistive technology out there that are designed strictly to be assistive technology devices. But as technology in general has evolved, we're seeing all sorts of mainstream technologies, um, think the Internet of Things, uh, the smart devices is an example, that are designed for one group of people, but for folks with disabilities, they sort of make things possible and become assistive technology. Or the other thing we're seeing going on out there is the building in of universal design features so that um, anybody can utilize it. And a lot of times those built-in features um, are very, very effective assistive technology tools for individuals. What we have not seen over the last few years or over the decades is um, the fact that funding sources haven't really built 
in the fact of the sort of the way that assistive technology has uh, evolved. And so uh, there's a fair number of funding sources out there that still view it as a standalone dedicated device. And so that's something to kind of keep in mind as you're thinking through what funding options might be available for somebody. And we'll kind of highlight some of these things as we go along. So if we move on to the next star, the other kind of thing that I wanted to touch on really quickly that I think is starting to come into play um, as we look at funding options for assistive technology is the way that prices have changed over the years or the way that we can set up um, the devices or systems that are less expensive uh, than they used to be um, even five years ago. So I just kind of randomly selected um, about eight different common forms of assistive technology out there and did a kind of a, a quick price check and found out that, for instance, um, for low tech items, they range from 10 to $50 for mobility devices down there at the bottom, they can start at 2000 and go to $14,000 and more. Um, but what I kind of wanted to highlight about this slide is that there are a lot of great assistive technology options out there, um, either standalone devices or mainstream devices that function as assistive technology that are not that expensive. And so that, again, is one of the things that kind of maybe can uh, sort of shift the paradigm in our minds as we think about this whole subject of funding and ways that we might approach it. So let's um, move on to the next slide. And we're going to kind of walk through, there's five slides in a row here, and we'll go through these kind of quickly. But this is how we um, saw utilizing the starter star that Angelina referred to a little bit earlier that's part of charting the life force to begin to kind of think through um, funding and do it sort of more as a conversation, as a brainstorming exercise uh, involving um, folks in the individual's world and then the individual themselves who's gonna be the user of assistive technology. And this is this first one here we refer to as the generic AT funding sources starter star say that five times fast. But to kind of familiarize people with it, let's start over on the left-hand side where it says technology. So if we were gonna use the STAR to kind of begin to think about the subject of funding, we wanna start with the devices and the related services. So you know, what can we do to make sure that we uh, know what device we wanna go out and seek funding for? We can do a device loan, we can go to a demonstration center, we can go out and check on different options on websites, we can talk to people that use those devices. There are lots of ways that we go about considering and identifying the most appropriate piece of assistance technology. And then we start to walk through uh, on that technology, what are the related services that we need to think about and make sure that we are kind of working into our funding. So, or, and so let's say it's training. Um, you know, where can I go out and find training? Well, I can find videos on YouTube or there are online webinars and um, those types of things that can provide me with the training that I might need to understand how to use a device. I have often said that one of the best resources for training in the world of assistive technology is YouTube. It is stunning to me how many great videos are being put out helping you be able to walk through a piece of assistive technology and understand it quickly and uh, fairly deeply. And vendors have also started to get really smart to YouTube and have started to put really good um, getting started videos on there or descriptions of their devices, um, those types of things. So then if we move up um, to the top of the star there, we, we talk about personal strengths and assets. Um, and if you need definitions on the uh, sort of the headings here, again, uh, go back and check out the Charting the Life course materials. They kind of give those definitions to help you understand uh, these quadrants. But if we look at personal strengths and assets, what can I bring to the table or what can my family bring to the table on this subject of funding? You know, maybe I want to have some skin in the game. So I think that I want to use some of my own money or maybe I'm working on financial independence and there's something that's relatively low cost. So I'm going to save up some of my money to purchase this so I don't have to unravel the maze of funding it through some third party source. And there's you know, something else you might consider is the fact that there are perfectly good used pieces of assistive technology or um, free devices. You may identify something um, that 
it costs a certain amount of money, but I've kind of discovered and other folks have sort of discovered over the years, if you drill down, you begin to find something that may be perfectly okay, that doesn't have all the bells and whistles. And we see this a lot with apps where there's a light version and then a full blown version. So maybe I should start by kind of exploring that uh, free version and see if that makes my, uh, satisfies my satisfy satisf, satisfies my needs um, and then as I'm saving my money or something of that nature to, to purchase it um, I can I, I can do that and then go on if I need those additional tools that might be in that app um, you can also ask uh, friends and family for help on related to assistive technology and uh, possible funding sources. And then there are those relationships um, that we can build. Uh, maybe we already have them or we can build them or they're just ways that we can go out there and kind of find some ways to fund AT devices. You know, I've seen people that have used GoFundMe campaigns to get a piece of assistive technology that um, they, they want, but they haven't been able to thus far successfully find a um, funding source. Um, maybe your family and friends would be willing to loan you some uh, loan you some money if it's relatively inexpensive. I know that comes with all sorts of fraught familial relationship issues, but I have seen it used before. And I've also, I also know people that um, have been receiving gift cards for a number of years, and they have started to suggest to folks that they would like to receive gift cards that can lead them to purchasing an app that they then use as an assistive technology tool. Um, and then for services, same thing, family and friends might be somebody to teach you how to use a device or to help you brainstorm or find uh, devices out there or related funding sources. And then we get into the bottom of the star here. And this is where we um, sort of break down, you know, what are the community-based services that are out there? What are the eligibility specific service uh, funding sources that are out there with the, that we might um, start pursuing or, and again, we're just brainstorming, we're throwing things into our chart here, just kind of figuring out what we have available as we begin this funding journey. And one of the things I have to confess that I sort of learned as I was working through some of these stars was that um, it does kind of get a little bit difficult um, to put them into the community-based or the eligibility specific, but that is not the important thing. The important thing is just that brainstorming, thinking through where maybe I can turn um, as I begin to pursue funding. So some of the eligibility specific, and we will talk about uh, some of these a little bit more as we go along here. You know, the, the funding sources, the most common one for assistive technology is Medicaid. We have waivers in the state of Missouri, vocational rehabilitation, um, state AT programs are all sort of eligibility specific. Uh, Community-based can th be things like our personal insurance and employer. Maybe we wanna create a health savings account. Maybe we're aware of some local foundations. Um, we know some service providers or some vendors that can kind of provide us with some of the services or we may wanna to talk to about um, ways that they can help us fund or find funding uh, related to services that we might need in addition to the device. So let's move on to the next slide, which is just a drill down. Um, we uh, kind of walked through the same exercise and just thought about funding sources for assistive technology in Missouri. And we could have um, had those bottom uh, quadrants even more full with options, which I thought was a good thing because one of the things that I've also observed over the years is that we are seeing more and more options for funding assistive technology as time goes on. So the top three quadrants there are going to be the same as what we just saw in the generic star. But these were some of the things that we kind of came up with as we walked through this. Um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, it's very similar to what we just looked at, but you know, we also you know, we just kind of drilled down to another level. And then over on the left-hand side there, the community-based ones, um, you know, we have organizations in the state of Missouri that we know have funded assistive technology, like the Cattlemen's Association, Cerner Charitable Foundation, Mo Better Foundation. We have device reuse programs. And thrift and reuse stores can be um, amazingly uh, rich sources of some forms of assistive technology, in particular durable medical equipment. So um, let's move on to the next star. And the next three stars are, are going to be people that have actually kind of gone through this exercise and how they address um, the whole idea of finding funding for assistive technology. And the first one's going to be Ava. And Ava, um, at the time that we did this, uh, was 12. I think she's like 13 or 14 now. 
And she's a student in a public school here in Missouri. And so what she needed were two things. The first one is uh, electronic enlarger. Ava has low vision. And the electronic enlarging was going to be something that was useful for her most often in an educational setting because she needed to be able to see the board, she needed to see print text, she needed to see um, her worksheets and all those types of things. And then she also needed an iPad because she liked some of the accessibility features that were built into the iPad and they helped her overcome some of the uh, issues with vision that she had. So when she sat down um, and started to kind of map all this stuff out utilizing the STAR, um, they decided that the, what they were going to do is they identified the electronic enlarging and they identified the iPad and they decided to use sort of a two prong attack, attack where they were going to focus in on options for electronic enlarging and then also options for uh, finding an iPad. And she also, um, she was aware that there were built-in accessibility features to the iPad. So one of the, th one of the services that they put over there on the uh, upper left-hand side was to find some online trainings that would walk her through how to utilize those built-in accessibility features. Um, she also had some uh, personal funds saved. So that was an option and that was a personal strength of hers. So she put that up there. And then in terms of uh, getting some more ideas and um, also maybe providing some services to help her understand how to use these devices. She knew an, an occupational therapist. Uh, she had a para that she had a good relationship with. And um, then there was a speech language pathologist that was a family friend. And they had all indicated to Ava that, gosh, there's some things we can help you with. Uh, we'll keep our eyes and ears open. We can show you some things um, related to the devices um, and so that you can understand how to use them. So then they started looking at actual funding sources. And one of the options that the, assist, uh, the um, occupational therapist suggested was a program that we offer through Missouri Assistive Technology, which is known as the AT Reimbursement Program. And so since educationally, um, that was where uh, Ava needed the electronic enlarging the most, um, and Ava has an IEP, um, and there are uh, and in that IEP is assistive technology. They decided to utilize the AT reimbursement program to get her that electronic enlarging device, which she uses in school. Then they thought about other options that were out there. They thought about the waivers. Uh, and then somebody suggested that Ava was, was going to need additional forms of assistive technology and related services as she went through her life. And she does have a goal of going to college. So they talked um, and she's actually done this. They have set up an ABLE account because ABLE accounts can be used as a way of funding assistive technology. So they got through the AT reimbursement program, the electronic enlarging, um, which she uses in school. And then they were forward thinking enough to realize we should be start setting some money aside because they're going to be new forms of technology that Ava needs as she goes along. Um, the iPad, they actually ended up getting it um, through um, one of the family friends uh, who came across one and provided it to Ava, but they had actually looked at utilizing the Mo Better Foundation as a source of funding that um, uh, the, the iPad. Uh, another example on the next slide is Andy. Um, and Andy is actually somebody that I know and I worked with. And so uh, Andy is sort of middle age and he has a full time job and he is a huge fan of knowledge. Uh, he loves to gain knowledge. It's like his hobby. It's his passion. It's what he gets excited for every evening when he gets home. Uh, he's a great conversationalist and you can talk about everything under the sun with him. But Andy is not exactly the best reader in the world. And so he wanted to continue to pursue his love of knowledge. Um, and he was aware that there were um, ways that he could utilize, again, an iPad with certain apps to convert text into an auditory format so that he could listen to it. And the whole uh, reading process wasn't the struggle that it was. And so some of the things that Andy, um, he needed, again, some, some, some learning. Um, wasn't quite sure how to utilize some of the built-in features. Um, and when he actually did receive some, some training, which he found online, he discovered that due to his um, dexterity issues, those weren't going to be good solutions. And so he, that's how he came up with the fact that he needed to utilize one of these reading apps. So he had great family support. He had some friends and neighbors, uh, his, support, his employment support provider, 
um, and then a friend at the library. And the friend from the library actually turned out to be one of the best supports as Andy kind of looked through funding options because that individual introduced Andy to the fact that libraries are rich sources of materials in alternative formats, either auditorily or uh, in digital text that could be used with this reading app so it could be converted into audio for Andy. So they, you know, the source of the materials was easily solved in this, but he still was trying to figure out um, where he was going to purchase the iPad. And so he looked at the Show Me Loans micro loan program. Uh, he also needed internet access. Somebody introduced him to the affordable broadband program, uh, which uh, has a reduction in the rate. And then Andy also learned that his local library uh, was a great source of learning some more skills related to computer uh, digital access, and then also um, had Wi-Fi so he could download books and one thing and another. So eventually Andy decided, um, since he has a full-time job, he was eventually going to go out and buy a larger iPad. But in the interim, um, through his family and some friends and some money he'd saved, he went out and uh, got a refurbished one to start. So instead of waiting for funding sources and going through the maze, he just utilized some of these charting the life course, the starter star uh, as a tool and was able to kind of address his funding needs creatively through um, his, his, his world around him. The last um, one here is um, sort of a different type of situation. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, this was a family that wanted an adapted vehicle. Um, they are, it's a very strong family unit. They wanted to spend more time together out of the house. And if you know anything about adapted vehicles, they are extremely uh, expensive. And uh, the mother in this case did a lot of research related to different ways to pay for an adapted vehicle. And she did some quite a bit of research on uh, the ways you can adapt a vehicle. And she had saved up quite a bit of money. Um, so again, kind of that idea of there may be more about for fun, some folks if they have some money in the equation or some skin in the game, um, that's more meaningful for them when they actually put all the pieces together but she still fell short. She probably had about 60%. Uh, the vehicle that she was looking at was somewhere in the neighborhood of $50,000. She'd saved up about 60%. So she was still quite shy of, of reaching the goal. And this, and she also raises another point when we approach funding, which is the idea of leveraging funds. You know, don't just use a source to fund assistive technology. You may be able to combine multiple sources to get to that end goal. And she was a perfect example of that because not only has she saved money, but she had also found some additional funders who were willing to make contributions towards that end goal. And she was able to um, utilize our CAT program to cover the remaining balance. So she was so close yet so far away until she reached out and utilized the CAT program. And so this is a great example of creatively going out there and seeking out multiple funding sources, leveraging dollars, you know, kind of pulling dollars from multiple buckets and staying focused on that end goal. And she was able to get the device, that uh, the adapted vehicle that she and her family needed as a result of just being creative and sort of brainstorming her way through the problem. All right. So let's move on now to um, just a high level overview of the wide variety of funding sources that are available. And I'm assuming that um, most folks will have some familiarity with some of these that we talk about. Um, but um, I'm hoping there are a few things that might be new options for individuals who are joining us today. Um, Okay, so um, I apologize. I sort of I feel like I mistitled this slide. It's not really completely health insurance, but health, you know, your, these insurance options that we have out there are a primary source of funding. And as long as I've been in the world of assistive technology, Medicaid has been the primary funder of um, assistive technology, in particular Medicaid. But private insurance has also been a source. And we're seeing a little bit of a shift in private insurance um, um, through some of the things that people have shared with me in terms of their sort of re-looking um, or maybe being a little more generous in what they uh, will fund um, through some of the policies. And this is 
With private insurance, I always have to say the same thing, which is um, coverages vary by carrier and policy terms. So uh, always look carefully, spend some time kind of looking at, at what they cover, but they will pay for assistive technology services and devices as long as they are deemed medically necessary and prescribed by a physician. Medicaid, uh, which is our program for medical assistance for low income individuals and families, uh, each state is required to, to fund certain basic services, and then states can choose to fund additional items, which, which may increase the options uh, in the world of assistive technology that uh, a state covers. Um, Missouri has a few examples of that, but there is a three-part test related to Medicaid. You know, the individual must be eligible for it. Um, they, too, use the term medical, uh, uh, medically necessary. And then the specific device must be funded um, through the Medicaid program. And there are some good resources online that kind of um, explain the devices that Missouri Medicaid uh, specifically um, may fund. You know, generally they tend to be durable medical equipment. Um, there is some, so things like manual and power wheelchairs, um, hospital beds, uh, they do fund augmented communication devices. Um, if it's a child under 21 who receives uh, Medicaid in Missouri, there are a broader range of devices um, that, are, that are funded. Um, and then I also think children uh, have funding for hearing aids, if I remember correctly, which just as a side note, um, hearing aid funding is, um, it, that would be a great advocacy issue <laughs> because we see that request quite a bit through our office, uh, the Office of Missouri Assistive Technology. Medicare is another funder of um, durable medical equipment and assistive technology. That's the federal health insurance program for individuals over 65, plus some individuals with disabilities. And it would be in plan B that you would find the um, funding for assistive technology. And it's a kind of a limited list, but you have um, generally durable medical types of equipment. So um, again, canes, commodes, crutches, wheelchairs and scooters. Um, and speech generating devices, I have been told, are considered to be uh, durable me medical equipment under Medicare. And then TRICARE, which um, I don't know, uh, it, we have many individuals in Missouri that either uh, they themselves or family members served in the, med in, the, in the military and they have TRICARE as their insurance. And so basically TRICARE can be thought of as the uh, healthcare program of uniformed service members, retirees and their families. And it has a pretty compre comprehensive coverage of um, uh, assistive technology. And one of the things I find interesting, actually somebody just shared with me the other day, um, a situation that, where they uh, were able to get a device funded through TRICARE and were really impressed by how quickly they did it and the fact that they covered this particular device. But one of the things that strikes me as kind of interesting when I was reading up on TRICARE is their definition of um, what they cover is uh, improves, restores, or maintains the function of a malformed, diseased, or injured body part, or can otherwise minimize or prevent the deterioration of the patient's function or condition. If you are familiar with the definition of assistive technology in federal law, that is not too far away from the same definition that we use for assistive technology. So um, that's a, there are a lot of things that can kind of be fit under that definition. And then also, not quite um, a little bit different than, than the traditional ways we think about health insurance, but we have the Medicaid waivers in Missouri. And I can't speak enough about how wonderful these are as an option for funding assistive technology. Um, there are four of them. They come through the Division of Developmental Disabilities. They cover up to $9,000 per waiver year for, per individual. And they have an extensive range of devices that fall under the definition of assistive technology that they will fund. Um, and this is a great source, and I've uh, been bragging to people outside of the boundary of Missouri for a long time about um, what a great source and what a, how many opportunities that our waivers, our waivers in Missouri open up for, for folks that, that receive waiver services as it comes to assistive technology. And then um, in the Department of uh, Health and Senior Services, uh, there is now a waiver, the brain injury waiver, and it does have a provision for funding assisted technology as well. And that is new within, I believe, the last year or so. And I um, don't know how aware folks might be of that. The next slide um, are a couple of examples of what I refer to as mandated services. 
And that sounds kind of draconian in some respects, but really what I mean by mandated are those programs that are authorized in some way or decreed by law to cover assistive technology as part of their services. And so public schools are the primary example of this. You know, every, every child who has an IEP and uh, as outlined in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, um, they should be considering assistive technology for those, for those students. And then if they do find that that student needs assistive technology to be able to access the educational curriculum, they are responsible for funding it. You know, I, the, the earlier we can get assistive technology into the hands of, of um, our youngsters, the better off they're going to be in terms of their long term future. But uh, do not allow schools to tell you that they don't have to cover assistive technology because it is something that they are supposed to provide to the students who need it, who are covered under an IEP. Um, for those who are seeking employment. Uh, our vocational rehabilitation services in the state of Missouri are funding sources or potential funding sources of assistive technology. We have um, uh, the sort of the two branches of it here in Missouri with traditional vocational rehabilitation. And then we also have rehabilitation services for the blind. And so those clients that are driving towards self-sufficiency and they're seeking employment and they're on that road, um, this may be a source, these may be a sources of assistive technology um, to help them in that long term pursuit of employment or their pursuit of um, uh, employment if they're kind of at the beginning stage of that process. And then employers can be a source of assistive technology as well. Um, there are provisions related to assistive technology that are under the ADA. And so, um, again, there's a long ways we could go with employers providing assistive technology, but it might be a source to have a discussion with um, to keep somebody employed or to help somebody find employment. Kind of changing gears a little bit here, there are some other government programs um, that may not be quite as well utilized or as well known. Uh, one of them is the PASS program. Um, for those individuals who receive Social Security, um, you can set up a, a you can set aside income uh, to fund work related goals, and that might be education, vocational training, or assistive technology. So that might be something to pursue, as are the impairment related work expenses, um, which can enable employees who receive SSI or SSDI to deduct work related expenses, which might uh, also, again, include assistive technology. And then for ind individuals transitioning um, from uh, institutional care or a nursing home. Um, we have the Show Me Home program in Missouri, and it is uh, formerly it was known as Money Follows the Person. They now call it Show Me Home, and it um, is a source of funding to, uh, there's a provision where we work uh, with the folks at the Department of Health and Senior Services to provide assistive technology for uh, that help somebody transition successfully. And then I, much, I mentioned earlier ABLE accounts. You know, one of the things that we can never do enough of is sort of plan our future and set aside money for things down the roads. These are great ways for families um, to set aside dollars that may be used somewhere down the road for their son or daughter for assistive technology, because we all know assistive technology is part of the lifespan. And the earlier we can kind of start working in what we might need in the future, um, the better off we're all going to be. So if you're not familiar with ABLE accounts, it might be a great resource to become familiar with and encourage folks that you work with to investigate and utilize as a way of um, uh, addressing needs uh, as time goes on. Um, all right, so let's uh, uh, move on to the next slide. Oh my gosh, it's 116. I have more stuff than I realized. So we're going to have to kind of speed it up here. Um, and then there's the community based options. And I didn't list specific ones in the state of Missouri, but I will reference our uh, on our website, at.mo.gov. Along the banner on the top, on the far right hand corner, there is a drop down list under the heading resources, and we have a funding uh, information manual there that tries to keep up all these community based options plus some of the other ones we talked about and provide you with kind of a brief overview and uh, contact information. But there are a number of disability foundations and nonprofits that um, have some funding options for individuals that sort of meet um, their mission. 
There are a number of fraternal organizations and service organizations, as well as foundations that might have disability as the area that they um, focus in on or specialize in. And so uh, again, might provide um, some funding of assistive technology. Some of these are statewide. Some of them are gonna be sort of local. Some of them are gonna be geographical. So it's always good to kind of um, get familiar with ones in your neighborhood, uh, your neck of the woods, along with a number of faith-based faith -based organizations. Um, I uh, actually have a son-in-law who recently um, was uh, I received a ramp through a faith-based organization, and they also provided him with some adapted gaming material. Um, and it was just um, sort of, um, I didn't even know this group did that, um, but they, uh, that was kind of one of their areas of, of uh, sort of community effort that they engaged in. And then reuse programs um, or buy used. Um, you know, again, I, met, I referenced some of the things that we're finding uh, in thrift stores, Habitat for Humanity sometimes have. Um, just as an FYI, we periodically go through our ETC program and pull stuff out and we're looking for people who can utilize devices uh, and find some of the, and take some of the used devices and, and provide them to folks out across the state of Missouri. All right, I'm gonna to have to kind of truncate um, my, uh, my, my stuff here. <laughs> so um, if you all bear with me, um, we're gonna do the, the speed dating. Uh, I was gonna highlight some programs that we have because one of the things is that funding is not, funding is about um, acquisition. So acquisition doesn't always mean we're looking for dollars. We also need to be aware of those sources in the state or outside of the state that have devices that might match our need and utilize those programs as well. And that's one of the things that we do um, through some of the programs we have here at Missouri Assistive Technology. So Angelina, are you ready? Because I'm just going to go bang, bang, bang on these next couple of slides. All right, so the first one is device reutilization. And there are two versions of this. We have a number of reuse sites, and then we have our swap and shop program. Next slide. Reutilization. We have centers across the state of Missouri. These are going to be durable medical equipment heavy, but these centers take in devices from the community. They re refurbish them, they sanitize them, they make sure they're safe, and they put them back out into the community. And this this map here um, shows the counties that the physical location is in, but a lot of times these service areas are larger. And so um, just because you're not in the highlighted county doesn't mean that they wouldn't have something. They also have from time to time other forms of assistive technology. I believe we've seen electronic and larger show up there. Um, some hearing related devices have shown up in some of our reutilization centers. They're worth getting familiar with. Next slide is swap and shop which we just sort of redesigned this and gave it kind of a new look and feel. But this is a user to user, person to person exchange program. So those individuals that have things they no longer need will list it in the swap and shop. Um, you can trade it, they might be selling it, but you can also seek out other forms of assistive technology. You could put an ad in swap and shop that says I'm looking for uh, an iPad, I'm looking for this kind of AAC device. Um, I'm looking for a battery for an old AAC device or something like that. So it's just designed to kind of hook people together who can uh, benefit, uh, they, somebody can get rid of something and somebody can still utilize it. One person's junk is another person's treasure as they say. All right, next slide. Um, and I'm, this is going to be really quick. If you're not familiar with our telecommunications access programs, might be a source of adapted telephones, um, um, tablet devices, uh, iPhones, as long as a person meets the qualifications for the respective parts of the program. But I really want to kind of drill in to make sure everybody's aware of the TAP for Internet program. Let's go back and use Ava as our example. You'll remember that she had low vision. Um, for individuals who struggle with using a traditional computer and um, they have internet access at home and they have a computer, this provides input and output devices. So this would be a program, going back to Ava, that she might consider using down the road because it is as her needs for screen magnification increase, maybe she'll need some kind of um, software program or maybe she'll need a keyboard. And so um, if that becomes a struggle for her to find, she could tap into the tap I program when that day comes and find those devices that can continue to enable her to do what she needs to do. Um, so uh, telecommunications access programs. Uh, next slide. 
Um, and then I can connect, which is uh, a program that we operate uh, that's geared towards individuals with the combined hearing and vision loss. It provides uh, distance communication tools and the related training. Um, this is a, a group of individuals who have generally been um, a little bit hard to find funding for. And this is a great source for input and output devices and other types of unique uh, assistive technology devices that they can, they can utilize if they um, meet the definition, the eligibility. Uh, eligibility of having the combined hearing and vision loss um, related. Next uh, slide. Um, show me loans. Okay, we're definitely going to have to do the high level over on this. Um, so this is our financial loan program. And a lot of times what I say about show me loans, it is not for everybody because it is a financial loan program. So somebody will be taking out dollars. And the reason that motivates people to use this the most is because sometimes you need something today to be able to do something tomorrow. And that would be kind of one of the primary reasons that somebody might consider taking out a show me loan. And there are what I refer to as four flavors. There's the general AT loan, the workability, which is for the purchase of equipment um, for somebody with a disability who uh, that's related to work. Um, and then the accessible vehicles uh, loans. And then there are the microloans. And I wanna hit home on the microloans. A lot of times um, uh, there are smaller, less expensive forms of assistive technology like an iPad with an app on it, or some of the smart home devices um, or wearable technologies that can be really valuable for somebody's independence, but they don't have you know, $250, $500, $750, or, up to $500 available, but they really need that today. It's gonna to make a difference. So they could take a microloan and some of the benefits of a microloan include um, the fact that it sort of starts to build their credit footprint, which can be really valuable because a lot of times folks with disabilities may not have a credit for footprint or they need something to uh, improve a credit score. Um, so microloans I think are kind of underutilized. Um, they are small loans that can help somebody get something um, under $500 that they may need um, to be able to do something now. Uh, and then next slide um, are, uh, okay, AT reimbursement, that's for school districts. I've touched on that already. I wanna hit home on the next slide, which is our kids assistive technology program. Um, I promised Eileen who runs this program that I would mention this um, because there are still funds available in this program uh, and we have additional funds coming for next federal fiscal year, but this is a funding source of last resort for children um, under the age of 21 who are eligible under the Children and Youth Special Health Care Needs Program in the state of Missouri, and it emphasizes low and moderate income families. And so assistive technology is available, uh, can be um, funded through this program, um, home, uh, modifications to homes, as long as the um, folks that live there own the home and then vehicle modifications as well. And so again, there are you know, funds for this program kind of ebb and flow. Sometimes we have them, sometimes we don't. Right now there are some funds available. So if you are working with anybody who meets those eligibilities or are aware of any families that might benefit from this, I strongly encourage you to kind of pass this information on to them. Okay, I apologize for the, um, the sort of the high level three sentences or less descriptions there, but again, all this stuff is available on our website, at.mo.gov. Okay, I wanna close by just kind of talking about some other concepts that um, I've kind of been thinking about, uh, shared with some other folks that I was thinking about as we were putting um, some ideas into the STAR. And the first one is um, the third party funder. So your Medicaid, your insurance companies, um, there are sort of some rules, um, or not rules, but guidelines to keep in mind. Um, make sure that you learn the specifics of their system and what they are, um, how they phrase things, um, what they fund, et cetera, et cetera, before approaching them. Um, I am aware of situations where people were approaching um, Medicaid or private insurance uh, for educational purposes. You know, there's medical necessity. And that's what they, a lot of these third party funders do. So understand who it is that you're approaching how they phrase things, what they fund, um, what their emphasis is. Be aware that there's always going to be a gatekeeper. Um, somebody, so you know, if you can learn what they're looking for, 
uh, it'll sort of uh, get you past the gate maybe a little quicker. Uh, the more information you can provide them, the better. They are, a lot of times, they're going to be bureaucratic environments. You can't change their timeline. You just have to be patient. Um, and then, um, again, the idea of just the request funding that is in line with their what they do. If they predominantly are funding durable medical equipment, if that's what they say they do, then that is what you would use them for. Don't um, throw applications their way if they don't fit that criteria, or if they're not medically necessary, then don't um, you know, waste their time with applications that are um, related to education. Always just, uh, conduct yourself in a professional manner. I would almost guarantee the fastest way to not get funding is to be impatient or unprofessional. Uh, and as much education as you can do to them, they do not necessarily know why people need things or what devices are. Um, so there's value in educating the funding system as to uh, the effectiveness of, of what you're proposing to purchase and um, kind of making sure that they are uh, understand what it is and why it's going to value you as you, as you pursue them for funding. Uh, more so, I think, for private insurance or um, those situations than um, some of the other sort of third party options that are out there. Um, you know. Uh, you can never be too nice. Uh, you probably get more results with um, honey than you do with, uh, what is it, vinegar? I've forgotten what the analogy is. Um, next slide is um, just some ideas, uh, some steps to securing funding. Um, this was an interesting idea that I'd never really thought about until I was doing some research here not too long ago. And that is, um, the suggestion was to locate an advisor. And at first, I didn't really understand what this person meant. Um, but then I got to thinking about it. You know, we have advisors in all sorts of aspects of our life. So an advisor is not somebody who, who goes out there and you know, is a professional funder. But there are advisors out there, you know, maybe a social worker, maybe somebody in a school district, um, maybe a vendor. They can all be valuable sources of guidance on funding sources, how to approach them, what kind of terminology they're looking for. Um, so again, utilize that network of folks that you may already know and um, find somebody that can kind of help you um, steer through. And from an agency standpoint, I thought a nice exercise would be to share funding sources. I've observed where maybe somebody in an agency knows this funding source or that funding source, uh, but you can kind of develop your own internal advising group uh, to share information and guidance in one thing and another. Uh, collect information about what it is you want, the related services, do a good device trial, maybe get an evaluation, um, make sure that device that you want to get funded is exactly the device that's going to benefit you and the most appropriate one because you may only have one shot at funding. Um, when you do make that request for funding, build in training and ongoing support. They may cover it, they may not, they definitely won't if you don't build it in and ask for it. Um, I've already touched on the idea of uh, using right words when you develop the uh, justification um, and uh, be prepared for a denial. Uh, there's always been this rumor out there that some of these sources will just automatically fund you on the first time. I don't know if that's true or not, but be prepared for that. And there is always an option for appeal. And oftentimes appeals can be overturned. And then, um, uh, you know, again, I, I stress the idea of providing written information about the device for which you are seeking funding because decision makers may not know anything about the device that you want. And we all benefit from sharing information and becoming wiser. And then the last slide that I have is, um, uh, and we'll send out this slide deck later, but I also thought this was a really good idea when somebody shared it with me, and that's create a funding request portfolio. You know, put all those, those things together that you may need as you put together funding requests. Don't reinvent the wheel. So if you've got a letter from a healthcare provider that outlines the specific disability and explanation for why it's important, um, if you've got a thorough description of how the AT would make a difference for that individual, why it's important, what goals that individual could obtain, um, you know, all those types of things, collect them together, put them in a portfolio, and that will just um, make it easier. You can have a history of who you've applied to, when you've applied. You've got all those things that you'll see commonly on application forms in one location, and it'll just kind of speed up the process and, and make life a little bit easier. So I thought this 
this idea of creating a funding request portfolio um, was something that was worth sharing. So again, really high level, just wanted to throw a whole bunch of stuff against the wall there to kind of hopefully get folks thinking. And uh, we are always available in Missouri Assisted Technology to tell you about the programs I touched on or to work through some of these other things that I touched on today. So thank you very much. All right, um, just to wrap up really quick, I'm going to send out a closing poll. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat as I go over the last few slides here. Um, let's see. All right, so our next um, mod workshop is gonna be August 24th. We're gonna focus on advocacy and engagement. Um, and then the rest of the schedule is there. Um, November and December have been changed from their usual dates just to accommodate for holidays. Um, you could go to our website, Life Course Tools, um, to go over any more of Life Course resources, um, some contact information. Um, you could contact Scout from Missouri Assistive Technology or David as well. Um, my email is probably the easiest one to get to because all of the no wrong door communications come from me. Um, so if you have a specific question, you can email me and I will forward it to whoever you need to get to. Um, thank you all for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time.